The Focus of Freedom, from the Freedom Tabernacle Baptist Church and Freedom Tabernacle Ministries in Atkins, Virginia. Home of Camp Freedom, a regional outreach to our youth. Freedom House, offering counseling, intervention, emergency shelter, and food distribution. And with our many missionary partners, reaching out around the world with the light and love of the gospel of Christ. And now, the focus of freedom. So upon the infallible, eternal, undeniable word of God I stand. As always, thanks, Sam, for getting us on the air, and thank you for being there for this week's edition of the Focus of Freedom. Summertime is upon us. Hope you enjoyed your Memorial Day break, and now we're moving on into the summer. Uh, orientation for eCamp here at Camp Freedom was yesterday and today. One week from tomorrow, uh, it begins, and we appreciate the trust that Many of you parents have placed in us uh, to allow your youngster, K-8, through eight, uh, to be with us here this summer from June the 12th all the way up to July the 21st. And we need, still need volunteer help now. So if you can help us, uh, all you got to do is remember that uh, address, uh, ftbcecamp uh, at gmail. Uh, dot com and it will be on your screen there and you can let the folks know that you are able uh, to come and help uh, work with the children this summer at Camp Freedom. We're looking forward to a wonderful summer and not quite ready to make the announcement yet in regard to our camp meeting and all that we're going to be doing this summer. Now, it may be a little too ambitious to make it on the 4th this year. We'll do that next year. But we're going to try maybe on up in July. But big announcement coming, God willing, just one week from today on next week's edition of the Focus of Freedom. So anyway, God bless you. Pray for us as E-Camp starts up next week and everything going on here at Camp Freedom. And then the completion... Uh, of this facility here uh, with the complete installation of all the lighting and sound and then the flooring and then we got to tackle the parking lot lights outside. We'll eventually get to that here shortly, we hope, and move right along and get everything finished up. But the work of the Lord goes on every day as it has for the last eight years come August. Uh, we haven't lightened up. Uh, everything else continues to go. Uh, the the uh, shelter ministry and, and the camp and everything. So we need your prayers and we need your volunteerism if you possibly can help us to come and help us with uh, this task uh, here at Camp Freedom this summer. As I said the last couple of weeks, maybe you could make it a home mission outreach uh, for your church and for your youth group. And just, just let us know you're able, let us know you're interested, and shoot an email there to that address, and we'll get back with you just real, real soon. They surely will. Well, thanks for being there tonight. We're going to meeting. The meeting you're going to be going into was on Memorial Day, of course, and we hope and pray that God will bless the message and all that went on uh, to your heart tonight. Heavenly Father, for that viewer that may be discouraged, disgusted, frustrated, aggravated, then beyond that, that one that may be sick and some very sick, maybe even with terminal cancer or whatever they're battling, their upheaval in their life, whatever it may be, God, I pray they will find peace sweet to their soul. And as you minister, may we all be open to your ministry and receive it and apply it to our lives. Thanks for this, another privilege of being together with all of our viewers here on the Focus of Freedom. And bless our moments together around your word as we worship and give you our worship and you give us your word. May it be a very quality time between us and you. Thank you, God. Amen. Now may he richly bless to all of our lives this week's edition of The Focus of Freedom.
nobody want to leave, but a whole lot of them still want in. That's right, please. That ought to tell you something. That's right. God bless our land. God bless our land. America the beautiful. Yeah. 
Yes, all across the country, the country needs a cross. Amen. God bless you. Well, if tomorrow all the things were gone, I'd worked for all my life, and I had to start again with just my children and my wife. I thank my blessed Lord to be living here today for that flag still stands for freedom and they can't take that away and I'm proud to be an American where at least I know I'm free and I won't forget the ones who died who gave that right to me and I'd gladly remain standing now. You got your Bibles open there to uh, Exodus chapter 12 to start with and then we'll be seated in just a jiffy. Exodus chapter 12 but let's read about some memorials of mercy. Now I want you to have your Bibles open. If you don't have your Bibles, Hannah, I'll have the scripture there for you on the screens but we're going to take a few minutes here in the house of God and look together into the word of Almighty God on this Memorial Day weekend. And I've got eight of them, so, and especially nine. So we're going to have to get on the mule and get on down to town. And old Brother Mike can't tarry long on either one of them. But the last one we're going to spend a little time on. So get ready now. We're going to read the scripture here, and then we're going to pray and trust God to deliver his word to our lives as we run through these memorials of mercy on this Memorial Day weekend. Uh, Hannah read it to the little children a few minutes ago. John 15, 13, greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. You're my friends if you do whatsoever I've commanded you. So let's read verse 14 together. And this day shall be unto you for a memorial. And ye shall keep a feast of the Lord throughout your generations. Ye shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. Heavenly Father, speak. May we all have ears to hear. Please, God, move strongly with conviction upon the lost and move strongly with conviction upon those of us who are saved, that we may flush out self to make total room for you, not just to be our Savior, but to be our absolute Lord. Thank you, God, in Jesus' name. Now we're going to sit together here in the sanctuary. This is the Passover. Now look back in... Uh, Got your Bibles open. Now, you won't have all of these verses on the screen, the one there, but so we'll look at the screen and then we'll look right back at our Bibles and I hope you have your Bible right there on your lap and you're looking at it. Verse 3, Exodus 12. We've showed you this countless times through the decades. A lamb. You ought to underline that in verse 3. A lamb. Now, verse 4, the lamb. Everybody needed an innocent sacrifice to cover the guilt of the individual. That's the theme of the Bible. 
All throughout the Bible, even when you get onto those old prehistoric uh, ancient cultures of ruthlessness and bloodthirstiness and all the rest of it in the old history of the Bible, all of it metaphorically, symbolically has to do with the curse of sin, sin, darkness, death. Then salvation, light, love, life, all of that. And Jesus stands in the middle with outstretched arms. He who knew no sin was made sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So in all 66 books of your Bible that constitutes the greatest book of all times, if you properly interpret it, you will see the central theme and that's the love of Almighty God. Now, the natural mind cannot comprehend that. If you're not a Christian and you don't have the Spirit of God living within you, then again, 1 Corinthians chapter 2 is very evident and plain on that. Then the natural mind can never understand, comprehend, or properly interpret the Word of Almighty God. You've got to be spiritually minded to be able to understand your Bible. So don't get overwhelmed with anger or frustration when you hear people in the world making fun, slinging slurs and criticisms and all the rest of it about the Bible. They don't know it because they don't know him. But when we know him, then his spirit, the author of the book, is able to teach us the book and lead us into all truth. So a lamb was needed and only one. That went from an indefinite article A to a definite article V. There's only one. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of us all. One way, one truth, one life. That's Jesus Christ. He said without apology, John 14, 6, to told Thomas when Thomas said, Lord, we don't know where you're going. And if we don't even know where you're going, how in the world can we ever know the way? And Jesus said emphatically, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. That's the great separation between religion and reality. I'm not up here purveying religion. I'm up here preaching redemption through the only one, and that's the Lord Jesus. People say, well, that's politically incorrect. You want to be politically incorrect or biblically correct? Make up your own mind. I didn't make it up. I didn't write this book. It didn't come out from me. It came to me, 1 Corinthians 14. So like it or not, rebel against it, stand against it, whatever. It's unchangeable, forever settled. There's only one way. His name's Jesus. So then it comes down to a personal possessive pronoun. Go from that definite article A, or indefinite, definite article V. Now the personal possessive pronoun in verse five, your lamb. You've heard about him, but do you know him? You've heard people preach about him. You've heard people talk about him. You've heard people sing about him. But do you know him as your personal Lord and Savior? Have you flung open the door of your heart and allowed him entry into every single solitary thing that you are? He wants to be your Savior today. Now, the death angel was passing by. There was only one way to escape death. They put the blood of that innocent sacrifice upon the doorpost and the lintel. And if you put a splotch of blood on each, on each doorpost and then one upon the lintel. As old Mays Jackson preached, I heard him preach countless times. If you put a spot of blood on the lintel, then two upon each doorpost and you just draw a line from the ground to heaven and from heaven to the ground. And you connect the lintel blood down to the ground and then the two doorposts, what do you got? Say it loud. If you properly interpret your Bible on any passage, you're going to see the cross. You're not going to see the bloodthirsty ruthlessness of an Old Testament ogre God. You're going to see the love and mercy of God. Because all the civil and criminal laws of man that God allowed Moses to put down, they can't save us. They just show how far short we all come before the glory of God. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That is a fair yet universal indictment and sentence against me standing in this pulpit. I can't look down upon anybody because I too have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But in that while we were yet sinners, Romans 5, 8, Christ died for us. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. 1 Corinthians 5, 12, 
Christ is our Passover. And look what God said when I see the blood in verse 13. Look at that. Blood, according to Leviticus 17, is the life of any living organism. That's the representation of life. God loved us. God came, born of the virgin, manifested himself in human flesh. The blood equals life. We were in darkness, Christ is light. We were dying, Christ is life. We were in chains, but Christ is liberty. In the fullness of time, Galatians 5, God sent forth his son. The manifestation of life and love and all God is in the presence of us and all we are. Isn't that amazing? The light of the world showed up 2,000 years ago in a shepherd's cave in Bethlehem. Now then, those people that had the lamb and they had the life of the lamb then over their residency and where they were living, here came the destroyer and destruction and death. And every resident in Egypt that had not the life of God secured on the outside to secure and save them on the inside, the destroying death angel visited and the firstborn male in every family, human and animal, died that night. But God said there in the verse we just read, when I see the blood, I'll what? I will pass over you. The Passover lamb had to be roasted by fire and ate with bitter herbs. The judgment and wrath of Almighty God fell down upon Christ upon the cross and he took the bitter herbs of sin and ingested them into himself. Everything that I was broken and bound and blind and miserable, Jesus Christ ingested into his own body. And Romans 8, he condemned sin in the flesh, the flesh of the Son of God broken and riveted and open on that cross. The veil ran in twain from top to bottom when he was crucified. And when he cried, it's finished. That thick veil down there in the temple, just several feet, but probably, what, 500 feet, something like, well, half a mile, quarter of a mile, I don't know, just to the south of the cross was the temple. South of the tree was the temple. And that big Old Testament veil, layer after layer after layer after layer of cloth, some estimates put it as much as maybe a, a foot thick. And they had that little maze interwoven in there where once a year the high priest could make his way back into the Holy of Holies with the blood of a lamb, the lamb, and the individual person's lamb. But boy, when Jesus cried to let's tie, it's done! Thank God that's one word in the Greek, three words in the English, it is finished. What's finished? Everything is finished that was required for your redemption and mine. His flesh was torn so that we could get through the veil from sin into salvation. Isn't that amazing? How in the world are you gonna tear a big old thick thing like that? Those priests thought nothing will ever tear that. Brother, when the main priest died on the tree, down there in the temple they heard a big tear and they looked into their utter amazement. The Holy Ghost wind blew it and that made a way where any old person walking by could get a glimpse of God's grace into the mercy seat of God Almighty and what had been a select private pathway for a minute few through the Old Testament law now became a super duper double highway of grace and mercy for whosoever will let him come and take of the water of life freely. Thank God I got in, you got in. Anybody and everybody can get in. So don't tell me this book's about hate. I know better. It's about love. It's not about exclusiveness. It's about inclusiveness. For God so loved the world. So that's the Passover. Now let's move on. Chapter 16 and verse 32. And Moses said, this is the thing which the Lord commandeth. Fill an omer of it to be kept for your generations. Memorials are something that helps us not forget. You go to the uh, Iwo Jima Memorial up in Washington. That makes us remember Iwo Jima. You go to the Pearl Harbor Memorial over in Hawaii. That makes you remember the USS Arizona and all the other young men and women who died there. 
All of these various memorials are just that, to stimulate our memory that we would not ever forget. Young people, do not forget the price that's been paid. Don't be duped by elitist entertainers who just want your money. I dare say if they had to go to the South Pacific now to possibly die, I have a question mark in my mind if they would. Now, is that judgmental? I'm sorry, but it's just my feeling. And yet they manipulate you young folks with their rhetoric. And all of these college professors today that are so anti-America, anti-Western civilization, anti-Christianity, multiculturalism is dividing us. And Jesus said, a house divided cannot stand. Assimilation, welcome to America but become one of us. You don't have to be exactly like me, but you need to reverence that flag and the blood that's been shed for the liberty that we enjoy here. You can be a Pittsburgh Steeler fan or a Dallas Cowboy fan. You can like the Yankees or the Red Sox. It doesn't matter, but when it boils down to it, through our history, we have always knew the bedrock of liberty in America is that we are one. We don't want pockets of this and pockets of that and people holding to the wrong. Listen, the culture that needs to be blended that we would celebrate our oneness as Americans. And don't come here if you don't want to be like us. (laughs) Now, is that ruthless or rude of me? Probably some folks will turn off the television. I don't know, but it is the truth. Let us not forget And now out there in the wilderness, they were hungry and they needed sustenance. And one morning they got up and there's little bitty things about like frost on the ground and like honey wafers. Look at it, Moses said, this is the thing which the Lord commandeth, fill an omer of it to be kept for your generations that they may see the bread wherewith I have fed you in the wilderness when I brought you forth from the land of Egypt. Then over in the book of John chapter six, Jesus said, I am that bread that came down from heaven. That manna in the Old Testament, those honey wafers. That's why, Max, I kind of like those, those graham crackers. <laughs> hey, they wasn't brown. They were little white pieces. And the people, you know, the children of Israel got tired of them, belly ached about them, and all the rest of it. But I'll tell you one thing. If you're going to be sustained in this wilderness, you'd better have something from heaven, something that they didn't expect, something that they didn't have before, something they'd never seen before, something they'd never experienced before, something they'd never encountered before. But God will make a way where there is no way. When you think there is no bread, there will bread, their bread will come down from heaven. And if you're or saved, you've got the bread inside your heart. You'll never hunger. You'll never thirst. There's a fountain of living water. There is fresh baked bread in your mind and heart and spirit every single solitary day. A tenth of a bushel they kept up for the people to remember and the children to remember. Well, that's the manna. Now let's move on to chapter 28. And verse 12. You see how all of these are about Jesus? (laughs) Chapter 28, Exodus, verse 12. And thou shalt put the two stones upon the shoulders of the ephod for stones of memorial unto the children of Israel. The stones on the shoulders of the priest. The onyx stones. Jesus bore our transgressions, our sorrows. And he has carried our griefs, Isaiah chapter 53. How in the world could all of this be man-made through thousands of years? Human secretaries that were used by the Holy Spirit who didn't know one another, they lived in different eras and different times. Explain that to me, Mr. Critic. It's easy just to poke fun and say, the Bible's foolish. It's ignorant, it's man-made. But are you really a critical thinker or do you just boast that without any substance to your proclamation? I love it when people say, well, I'm a critical thinker when I think they're far from being a critical thinker. Just think about it. 
1,600 years. Documented without argument. The parchments are there. The record is clear. The Septuagint, and many of we won't get into all of that. You can't argue that academically. And yet all of it so beautifully, prophetically, talks about Jesus from Genesis to Malachi. How in the world could all those people made it up when they didn't even know one another and didn't even live in the same historic setting? How? Coincidence, that's like your belief in evolution then. We all believe something. So offer me a little dignity. I'll offer you a little dignity. You don't have to believe like I believe. Here in America on this Memorial Day, you have the right to be an atheist. You have every right to make fun of me. And if I don't like the content of your speech, I'm not going to whine like a little whipped baby or a little rat eating onions and try to find me a safe place. I'm not making fun of you. I'm just trying to say, wake up. Here I go again. I apologize before I say it. But can I quote Lakin again? Use your head, the woodpecker does. It's easy to put something down and refuse to hear it. Because you apparently, in my view, have no real security or no real confidence. Because when you are secure in who you believe and what you believe, you're not intimidated to hear an opposing view. And I'll give you the dignity that you deserve as a fellow human being. I don't want to beat you in the head. I don't want to hurt you in any way, shape, or form. But why not return the favor and give some of us that you don't agree with a little dignity and a little tolerance. Now that we've been tolerant, we've been respectful, and now there are people coming to the seizing of authority in America, they offer no tolerance. Because if you don't believe exactly like they believe, then you're not part of it anymore. Somehow or another, you're shut out. But all of these stories are amazing. Look at here in, uh, oh, verse, let's see, verse 8 of Exodus 28. See the gold, the blue, the purple, the scarlet? Gold is deity. Blue represents heaven. Purple represents a king. Scarlet represents redemption. Fine linen represents salvation. Even the colors that were chosen preach the gospel of the Son of God. And now two black onyx stones, two of them, with six tribes' names written on one Six tribes written on the other. And the priest wore those onyx stones upon his shoulders. And again, Isaiah 53, he bore our griefs and transgressions upon his shoulders to the cross. You've got a sin bearer. Every tribe that represented the inclusiveness of everybody Jesus just didn't pay the debt for some. He paid the debt for all. For if the debt was universal, then the payment had to be universal. Please, you ministers who believe that Jesus only died for a select few, may I humbly disagree strongly because all has sinned. And if my Lord didn't pay the cost, then I still owe it. But his blood covers it all. He went to the cross bearing the sins of everybody. What a memorial. The stones on the shoulders. Now the blue ribbons on the borders, Numbers 15. Numbers 15, verse 39. Verse 39, Numbers 15. And we'll read this verse. And it shall be unto you for a fringe that ye may look upon it and remember all the commandments of the Lord and do them. And that ye seek not after your own heart and your own eyes after which ye used to go 
doing wrong. I won't use that word uh, there because of respect for the children in here. But uh, you can read it and you see it in your KJV. But the people went afoul. The people went astray time and time again. Could they keep the Sabbath when God rested? Somebody told me the other day, they said, man, you'll take a little day off. God did. Who do you think? You're better than God. And there's a lot of, there's so much misunderstanding about everything. But what did I say in the Bible? What did I say a minute ago? If you properly interpret, you'd see Jesus. Who is your Sabbath? Who is your rest? Jesus. What was he doing on Saturday? He was conquering death, hell, and the grave. And on Sunday, he just not brought a new day and a new week and a new month and a new year and a new, he brought in a new forever. There's rest in redemption, eternal rest. So this man, this woman started this religious group, this denomination, all the rest of it. If you don't know by now, brothers and sisters, leave religion and let the Redeemer be the Lord of your life. Don't be duped by what man says. Be delivered by what God says. And allow the Savior of your soul to be the unconditional, unlimited Lord of your life. And don't get frustrated and fearful and all aggravated about what somebody says contrary about you. Oh, you're not right. I've had a lot of people tell me I'm not right. And ever since I've started out in this way, I don't believe right, I don't preach right, I don't think right, I don't do right, but they're not gonna judge me and I'm not gonna judge them. There's one that'll be on the beam of seat. There's one that's gonna judge you, one you're gonna give an account to in that day. So every day, give an account to him every step along the way. And perfect love, 1 John 4, casts out fear. You don't have to be intimidated by man. Just know this right off the bat. Somebody ain't gonna like you. But somebody loves you. Some old fellow human's probably gonna think you're worthless. But God thinks you're priceless. So honor God in all you are. And in all that you have, glory, glory, glory. So this guy broke the Sabbath. They killed him. And, but just not for that, they said, this blue ribbon, attach it to the fringe of your garment. God said, I will uphold you, Isaiah 41, 10, with the right hand of my righteousness. Not only do you have salvation and progressive sanctification, but you've got divine support every day that you live. Underneath are the everlasting arms. Somebody said to me a long time ago, and I've mentioned this a time or two through the years, but I was in the bowels of some hospital somewhere sometime, Janet coming off one of her mini surgeries, whatever. I was sitting there, it was about 3 o'clock in the morning, some old soul come by, they was well-meaning, and they said, oh, we feel sorry for you, preacher, you ain't got a pastor. (laughs) Oh, I quickly quoted them what God said through the pen of Peter. I said, oh, yes, I do, and he's right here. He's the only one you'll ever need. It's good when y'all do things for me. And what little bit I get to do for you, it, well, you know, if you see me coming, I'm there because I want to be. It ain't because you pay me. <laughs> I could have probably went all day and said, not said that, could But the Lord is your pastor. Brother Kenneth, I appreciate you calling me bishop. And I am your earthly bishop, one of them. But you know who your real bishop is. I couldn't go to Iraq with you, but he did. And God bless you tomorrow as you speak at the Veterans Day thing. Go support Brother Kenneth tomorrow if you can. And I couldn't go to Afghanistan, but your real bishop did. And when that distant whistle of that projectile was coming, he moved you. He's your bishop. He's the best friend you'll ever have. I got a blue ribbon on the border of my robe. (laughs) That reminds me, ain't nobody like him. I can sense somebody said, I never heard about that blue ribbon on the border. Well, you're hearing about it now. Blue ribbon's on the borders. You don't need nobody but God. If you've not gotten, and people will come to me and say, yes, but we still need this. We still need that. Let me tell you something. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. 
I like the gravy, but honey, a good old hot biscuit will do if I ain't got any gravy. Now, you can put the gravy on me if you want to, and I'll appreciate it. But if you don't, he's already the bread that came from heaven to my heart. So make sure you know, memorials of mercy, the blue ribbons on the borders. Now, number 16, it's right there near verse 40. Number 16, to be a memorial unto the children of Israel that no stranger which is not of the seed of Aaron come near to offer incense before the Lord. Let me quickly put this out. Uh, This is the brazen censers of incense. And let's just be real quick. The law came by Moses, but grace and truth. And can't you see Jesus on the day of the resurrection ascending up into heaven? See, I stink. (laughs) And if I don't use deodorant and take a bath every day, I really stink. I can't approach a holy God. How in the world can I approach God? But between death and life, Aaron took those brazen censers and he would burn that sweet smelling sacrifice and he would go into the presence of God. On resurrection day, Jesus told Mary, don't touch me, I'm not yet ascended. So the law was destroying us and we were enslaved in darkness and death. Over here was light and the holiness and the righteousness of God. He can't even look on sin. His righteousness demands a holy response to sin. That's why he turned his back on his only son as Jesus died in our place on the cross. But on the third day, when he conquered death, hell, and the grave, defeating sin and Satan, He told Mary, don't touch me, I'm not yet ascended. He took the brazen censers. Brass is judgment. And yet atop the judgment was the incense of a sweet-smelling savor. And now into heaven itself. Didn't you get it? He descended into hell to pay the debt. But how in the world if we escape that place only through Christ how can we enter into that place we were all destined to be locked there even the Old Testament saints were already there but he led captivity captive so he went down to get them and to pay the debt that we owed to satisfy the sin debt and then he conquered death hell and the grave the rock rolled back Jesus wasn't there But now, Moses brought the law. But now grace and truth by Jesus. Now the Father hears footsteps passing through the 1,500 mile pearly gate in glory. Walking 750 miles to downtown New Jerusalem with the brazen censer of grace and the brazen censer of truth. And he lays them upon the altar where they are forever there as a sweet incense to God Almighty. And now when God senses that, he turns his face to that who he had his face turned away from. That was me without hope. But now I got hope in him, through him, by him, for him. That ought to make everybody in here want to jump up and say, thank you, Jesus. We didn't get justice, we got mercy. Joshua 4, 7. Joshua chapter 4, verse 7. Then ye shall answer them that the waters of Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord when it passed over Jordan. The waters of Jordan were cut off and these stones shall be for a memorial unto the children of Israel forever. What we got there? The grace gate at Gilgal. (laughs) How are you going to live for God by grace? How are you going to say no to the world and yes to the word by grace? How how were you saved? Not of yourselves. 
then why in the world, once we get saved, do we want to take the lead then and kick Jesus, the king, out of the kingdom and go getting all discombobulated over what you believe and arguing with people and start worshiping standards and scholarship and putting standards and scholarship above the Savior. Does that make sense? That's the very reason why they doubted God at Kadesh Barnea. And God sent the 12 up into the land on a reconnaissance mission. They came back 40 days later. 10 of them said, no way that we can take that land. Oh, they discussed it. <clears throat> Please don't be Judas-like. I don't like the way the singing goes. Well, pray about it. You say, spiritual, won't you pray down God's power and it'll change the way you want it. But I don't know if you're interested in talking to God because he don't listen to sorry gossip. Holy Ghost will get on you like white on rice and harder to get off melted Cairo syrup. So you got to find somebody that'll listen to your criticism. And all your criticism's doing is a flimsy, feeble attempt to build yourself up. Buzzard bait, jackal food, dying in the wilderness. I don't care how much you say, oh, I know God, I love God, this is the way we're doing it. Moses, we cannot go and we're not going to go. Why did you bring us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? But two of them. Joshua and Caleb, like little youngins on a Saturday morning at a circus or something, all excited. Old Caleb bringing out pomegranates and nanners that long and pouring them down, laying them down at, at Moses' feet, saying, this is the fruit of the land. And then they got that one cluster of Esco grapes on that staff they was carrying back, flopped it on the ground before Moses, said, I want you to look what we found. And if you think that's something, look at these mangoes, nanners, oranges, look at these lemons. Lemons, look at everything. And besides that, there's oak, hickory, hardwood, every place. There's springs, artesian well. There's fresh water, everything we'll ever need up there in that land. Let's go up at once and take it. We're well able to take it. But 10 of them said, now, wait a minute, Moses. Uh, obviously, Joshua and Caleb, while they were wading barefoot like two little children, down that Esco Creek up there. They was in Hebron. They were in the high ground. That's where the fresh water belches out of the high rock and flows down with life. We were over yonder down there looking at the sons of Anak. We were just grasshoppers in their sight. If we go up there, we're going to die. Because we'll never make it. So we want to straighten them out here and now, right publicly. We want you to know how childish they are, how wrong they are, and how right we are. And then one spoke up and said, oh, I'd give anything from a cucumber from Cairo. Oh, I'd love to have a cucumber from Cairo. I'd love to have me an apple from Alexander. Alexandria. Some of y'all don't know what I'm talking about. That's Egypt cities. They didn't want God. Their body got out, but their soul never did. Their body got out, but their heart never did. Caleb and Joshua knew they were already Abrahamic covenant children. They weren't just playing like little boys wading barefoot in the creek. Caleb said to the younger man, how you like my stream? It's yours too. We're Abrahamic children. We don't have to be down there sweating and hot, afraid of Anak. Reach down there and get your cup your fist up with that cool water and put it on the back of your neck. And don't be intimidated by giants. Be enjoying the grapes. The choice is yours. You don't have to die. God didn't, God didn't bring you out to die. He brought you out to live. He's the restoration of the covenant. He's everything that you will ever need in your life. 
Do you understand that? Well, when they finally got to cross, those ten weren't with them. But Joshua and Caleb were. And now they're older men. They were 40 when all that happened. Now they're between 80 and 85. Caleb, 85. But he said, I can still see. I remember telling the doctor one time, I said, I believe I'll be like Caleb. I ain't going to lose my eyesight when I got 50. I did. I needed reading glasses. Old Mike Sage found out I ain't Caleb. <laughs> he was unique, but it's spiritual. I hope we still have 2020 spiritual vision. And they crossed, and Joshua said, Take me 12, give me 12 men, grab a big rock, go down there where the priests are standing, and the waters came crashing down on those stones, representing again that the God who was the way out of slavery and in the, from the wilderness into the land of victory was covered with the wrath and the judgment of God. And then at Gilgal, there's the grace gate at Gilgal. They erected 12 big stones and Joshua said, never forget that the stone that brought you out of Egypt is the stone that brought you into the land that God Almighty has planned for you to dwell in, the land of promise. Now, what happened to those stones in the river? Jeremiah 31, 34, listen to this. God said, I'll forgive all your iniquities and I will remember your sin no more. Isn't that amazing? Psalms 103, verse 12, as far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. Those sins are gone. There was a lady years ago that had had an abortion. And it was very, very problematic to her. We were at an altar praying. She just couldn't realize the depth, the width, the height of God's forgiveness. If you're struggling with something you've done, there's somebody that's already bore that sin on the cross. God's love is universal. And God's grace and God's precious blood is precious. There's forgiveness. There's redemption. You can let go of yesterday because there's a gate grace at Gilgal. <laughs> the stone that took your sin and got covered with judgment came up out of that river. <laughs> and now he's the gate in the land of victory to the land of victory. And he'll never leave you and he'll never forsake you. I said, can you imagine yourself in your mind on a ocean, a little ocean ship and you're over in the Pacific Basin where they say the waters are miles and miles and miles deep to where down in the depths it's total darkness, the sunlight can't even reach it. I said, now imagine you've got in your hand a small black marble. And I said, I want you to roll it around in your fingers and I want you to feel it. Now I want you to realize and, and think that your sin is in that little stone. Jesus took all your sin and he put it in the sea to be remembered no more. I want you to imagine going out on the bow of that boat and there's the Pacific Ocean. And you take that little black pebble and that represents your sin. And I want you to rear back in your mind and imagine throwing that just as hard as you can. And as it leaves your hands, you look into the bright sunlight. Due to the brightness of that sun, you didn't even see it leave your hand. Because the S-O-N took your sin. He took it. And he buried it. Now you're not even seeing it as it touches the surface of the Pacific Ocean. It's insignificant in comparison. It's nothing. A little bitty marble into the bowels of the Pacific Ocean. And now that little marble starts sinking. And gravity's pulling it down. A hundred feet, five hundred feet, a thousand feet, a half a mile, a mile, two miles. Still going down. It's losing sunlight. 
it finally reaches the bottom. And the huge, powerful currents churn it far down into the ocean floor. I said, where's that marble? She looked over at me and her eyes got big. And she said, it's gone. I said, now where is she sin? She said, it's gone. Release your sin through the blood and into the love because that ocean represents the love of God and it's massive. Your sin, he made a way. There's a gate at Gilgal. Yes, there is. A statue by the sanctuary. We got to hurry, don't we? Some of you said he'll never make it. Joshua 24, 27, real quickly now. Shechem just means early rising, diligence, uh, shoulder again. There was a statue by the sanctuary at Shechem, Joshua wrote about. And he says in the last chapter, he said, I want you to stay true to God. It's that simple. That simple. The memorial of God's mercy gives us the might to be merciful. And not get overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Don't get mad at people because they're human. Don't get frustrated at people because they're aggravating. You be stronger than that. Now one final one, the Ebenezer Stones, 1 Samuel chapter 7, verse 12. Between uh, Mizpah and Shin, Samuel took a stone, called it Ebenezer. The Lord helped us. That's revival. Psalms 121, I'll look to the hills from whence cometh my help. My help comes from the Lord that made heaven and earth. Now, here's the deal. Look at it on the screen. From the Passover to the Ebenezer stones, they all represent what? Our Lord. Our Lord. Matthew 26, Mark 14, Luke 22, 1 Corinthians 11, John 13, all of those scriptures are about our Lord's Supper. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 24 and 25, I think Jesus said, take this bread, this do in remembrance of me, take this grape juice, this do in remembrance of me. Luke twenty two nineteen, 19, he said, this do in remembrance of me. So on this Memorial Day weekend, don't forget tomorrow when you're eating your hamburgers, hot dogs, some of you might have a steak or two, I don't know. But remember this. John 6, I, you really need to see this before we go. Really turning your Bibles over to John 6 where Jesus said a very powerful thing that offended a lot of the disciples. A lot of the disciples left because they thought, is he talking about cannibalism? Because he said, you've got to eat my flesh and drink my blood, and it, it really fouled them up. But number one, his, the, his body of sacrifice, he gave himself totally and completely. And he said in verse 41 of John 6, look at it, I am the bread which came down from heaven. Verse 48, I am that bread of life. Verse 51, I am the living bread. He said, your fathers ate man and they hungered again. And I'm this living bread from heaven and you'll never hunger. Verse 53, except you eat the flesh of the son of man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Now they got offended, but Jesus wasn't talking literally. He said, I'm coming to be your sacrifice. And that's why back there in the communion chapel, if you'll take a moment before you leave today, we've got the bread. You take the first little lid, you pull it up. There's the bread broken for you. And there's the cup right there, right outside those doors. And you can remember the Lord giving his body to be broken. And that Sunday morning, Ella, I didn't know it that morning when you pointed me to that little bench as an altar. But I was hungry. And you showed me the bread. I sure ain't been perfect, big man. (laughs) Long ways from it. 
but I never will forget this Sunday morning. I got a bite of bread. And when your food goes in you, your metabolism and digestion transports it to all the cells of your body. He's in you. Greatest memorial you'll ever celebrate is his body of sacrifice and his blood of salvation. Look at there. We're redeemed with the precious blood of Christ, the life of God. Forgiving, faithful, forceful, blessed, the blood, the life of God with the precious blood of Christ. So his body of sacrifice, the memorials of mercy, his blood of salvation, and then chapter 13 of John, his basin of service. John chapter 13, verse 5 Jesus girded himself with the towel, got down at that basin, and started washing their feet. Real quickly, in summation, without going into great detail, all that was is the sovereign of the universe became the servant of those disciples. The one who washed feet, took care of the slop jars and all that, was the lowest slave. That was the house slave. Get this. The sovereign willingly became the servant. The washing of the water of the word. Ephesians 5. Psalms 119. Wherewithal shall a young person cleanse their way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. The body, the blood, the basin. This is the basin. Got to read it. Next time somebody starts really being negative and throwing out a lot of negative energies, criticizing this, that, and the other, just ask yourself the question. Don't challenge them because probably there's no point in it because you're not going to change somebody whose mind is like cement, thoroughly mixed and well set. But what they're telling you, revealing their heart by what their mouth says, Matthew 12, is they not, they're not in this book. This is the basin. That's why Jesus told Peter, when old Peter brought his feet back, he said, you ain't washing my feet. Jesus said, if I don't, you have no part of me. He wasn't dumb, was he? He ducked his head down there and said, well, if that's the case, Lord, just wash my head and just give me a whole body bath. That'd be all right. Heart, soul, and mind. In Matthew 20, and this, we're done, right? At, well, we're, not, we're not too far off. Matthew chapter 20, you've got to read these verses with me. I don't think Hannah has these down. Matthew chapter 20, and it's verse uh, 25 through 28, I think. I want you to see these verses. This is the basin as you leave today for Memorial Day. Verse 25, Matthew 20, Jesus called them unto him and said... You know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them and that they are great and, and they that are great exercise authority upon them. But it shall not be so among you. Don't you ever try to dominate anybody else or have power over anybody. Nobody. That's what Jesus said. But it shall not be so among you. But whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. So on this Memorial Day weekend, would you offer yourself now in oneness with Christ as a memorial of his mercy, as a living epistle that people can read your life and therefore see Jesus? In you, that's the challenge on this Memorial Day. Dear Lord, I pray that you will just solidify on all of our minds as your people spiritually minded. That's not a bunch of big eyes and little U's that the closer we get to you, the less likely we are to try to overlord others or dominate others or to push or manipulate for our way and will all the time but we want your will all the time. 
And we're willing to fit in where you fit us in. So God, speak to us about the body, the blood, and the basin. The ultimate sacrifice, you became servant of all. And yet you are sovereign over all. And yet you humbled yourself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. So I pray, O God, that we will take up our cross daily, individually. That way would be such a blessing collectively to your church. And minister to all of us, God. And we not only ask your blessings upon the ministry of Camp Freedom here on Freedom Ridge, but the many, 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 many wonderful outreaches and ministries that all of our local churches do. God, we pray that you will unctionize every effort and that we will know that we're all laboring together to advance the glorious cause of your gospel and your love. So help each one, Lord, to find the identity that you have for us. For there we find purpose and peace and ultimate personal satisfaction that all of this stuff in the world could never afford us. Only your word can lead us to that point. So minister, God, to every one of us and may you bless those, God, who are weakened because of personal battles that they're fighting or burdens that they're carrying. And God, those that are so troubled, maybe over their child or their aging parent or whatever the dilemma is, help us all to know that you are with us and you're not going to leave us. And even when we slide and even when we stumble, you're always there to give us peace in the storm, direction in the midst of confusion. So God, may we truly be students of your word and servants within your work. Bless every local church now, every minister watching. My God, we look up, we see you looking down. We reach up, you're always reaching down. And like we've prayed countless times here on the Focus of Freedom, may we always put our faith in your grace. God, you'll save the lost. You'll stir us all to revival. I say, you'll do it if we will just get in that position of allowing you to do it. Thank you, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, faith, hope, and love, ladies and gentlemen. And may faith, hope, and love increase in your life. And may the God of peace be merciful unto you. And may the love of our Heavenly Father, the grace of our Savior, and the sweet friendship of the Holy Spirit be real and dear to you now and always. Help us at Camp Freedom this summer if you possibly can by simply volunteering like so many of us do. And what a blessing that is to see this work complete from people just like you who love God, who love children. And just contact us. And there again, that, that email address, you have it, I hope. And we'll be looking to hear from you. Well, thanks. Pray for us. We absolutely can't do without the power of God and the prayers of God's people. Thank you so much for watching. Until next week, may God bless you richly. Then may he use you for his glory and to be a real blessing to someone else.